Joel chapter 2 beginning from verse 23 the latter rain be glad then ye children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God for he had given you the former rain moderately and he will cause to come down for you the rain even the former rain and the latter rain in the first month reading to 27 as a result of that rain the floor shall be full of wheat and the fat shall overflow with wine and with oil and I will restore to you still on account of that rain the years that the locusts had eaten the canker worm the caterpillar and the palmer worm my great army which I sent among you 26 and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that had dealt wondrously with you. I like this. It says, and my people shall never be ashamed. And my people shall never be ashamed. Final verse 27. And ye shall know by all of these evidences that I am in the midst of Israel that I am the Lord your God and none else. And again he repeats, my people shall never be ashamed. Amen. We are in the days of his power. Settle this for a fact. Let it be distilled upon your spirit man that we are in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. We are in the days of his power. We are in the days of strange revivals, strange awakenings, outpourings of the Spirit. Days where the power of God is ready to be on full display like never, like never before. The Bible says in Psalm 110, Psalm 110, 110 verse 3 I believe. It says the people shall be willing in the days of thy power the people shall be willing in the days of thy power i have seen these formations and right now like droplets it is beginning to amplify from nigeria parts of africa across europe you know down west the spirit of god is moving with full force as we begin to prepare to wrap up this church age as we know the Spirit of God knows that there is still much to be done and there is an acceleration system in the Spirit and that is coming through and outpouring there are end time anointings there are end time mantles there is a quickening that is happening to the Saints like never before accelerated trainings by the Spirit of God because of the urgency that is at hand so settle it for a fact that we're in the days of his power. A day where we will see the manifest power of God in the midst of his people. Culminating to salvations, healings, territorial transformations like never before. And let me tell you the truth. The purpose of announcing this to you is to remind you that you are part of that army. If we are in the days of his power then it's important for you to know that the power of God depends on how many vessels are willing and are aligned to be endued with that power. I said, tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. All through scripture and even from modern history, we see moments of awakenings, moments of outpourings, moments of signs and wonders where territories were literally held at a standstill because a few people, individuals sometimes, or groups of people who were able to align with the spirit, they carried strange fires and they blazed that fire throughout their time, throughout their cities. Are we to talk of the wealth revival or the Azusa Street revival or many that have come before us? And now, even in modern history, men and women who shook nations, history books are full of their exploits. Unfortunately, some history did not do justice to the level and the extent of power that they carried. We only know what history told us about them. 
But we know for a shorty that with the kind of alignment that these men and women had towards God, they must have done greater than what history told us. And now there is a new page in the spirit that has been opened. It's time to write someone else's story because that book did not stop. That archive of wonder-walking miracle workers, that, that, that history book in the spirit, it was supposed to be a continuation. The apostles wrote their own. The patriarchs wrote their own. Everyone, now the page is open for you. And my assignment tonight is to guide you and to help you see that in truth, we are in the days of his power and there is a latter rain, a latter rain, a latter rain that is pouring upon the spirit, upon the nations, the inhabitants. Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 15, the Bible says, until the spirit be poured upon us from on high, until the spirit like rain be poured upon us from on high and then the wilderness a destiny that is as a wilderness a nation that is as a wilderness a family that is as a wilderness be counted for a fruitful field and a fruitful field be counted for a forest let me paint for you a little picture of what an outpouring looks like let me paint for you a picture of what a season of prophetic awakening looks like because for many of us we do not have an idea what does it look like how do I know that this is a season of outpouring what does it look like in agriculture most of us know when the season of a harvest comes you know how the crops look you see how busy the farmers are you also know how a planting season looks like those who are students you know how it is when school resumes and you know how it is when there is holiday so you can literally look at a picture and tell what season it is when you see a school empty without any word of knowledge you just say they are most likely having holidays when you see a lot of students they most likely have resumed you can look at the atmosphere and the spirit and you can tell with precision because there are events that follow the prophetic speakings of God. So let me paint for you a picture. What does it look like when God is moving? What does it look like when the spirit of God finds unrestrained access through a life, through a church, through a ministry, through a vision, through a family, through a destiny, through a business, through a territory what does it look like what does the move of God look like what does a season of signs and wonders look like what happens show me a picture of an individual who is experiencing a revival and an outpouring if you do not have that picture you will lose out on prophecy and lose out on seasons it says the Lord was in this place and I knew not what does a season of outpouring look like number one the season of outpouring comes with a manifestation of mighty works mighty works in and through the saints the season of outpouring is a season of mighty works the season of the latter rain when the Holy Ghost moves upon a people it culminates to mighty works it's a season of extraordinary manifestations what does an outpouring look like a season of greater influence where the church gains ascendance and their influence becomes incontestable even within their world not just from a spiritual standpoint that the church gains visibility like we find in Isaiah chapter 2 from verse 2 and 3 the Bible says it shall come to pass repeated also in Micah that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it I like verse 3 verse 3 says and many people not few many people and outpouring is a, is a season where multitudes are affected by the influence of the spirit it does not happen to a few 
The training may be for a few, but an outpouring affects multitudes. In the day, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says 3,000 souls in one service came to Jesus. The season of the latter rain is a season of mighty works, not mighty discussions about works, doing exploits by the Spirit. The season of the latter rain is characterized by greater witness. Greater witness. Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. The Bible says, and with great power. Acts, did I get that right? 433. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace, my God, great grace was upon them all. The season of the latter rain comes with grace to be a witness like never before. To bear witness to the truth. John chapter 1, 6 and 7. The Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Verse 7, it says the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. That man through his witness, the abundance, the quality of his witness might believe. Witness with signs, witness with wonders, manifestations of miraculous, you know, occurrences of the Spirit. John chapter 20, 30 and 31, the Bible says many other miracles, signs, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which were not recorded in this book. Next verse, but these are written. They were documented that when you read them, you might believe in truth that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God and that in believing, you will have life through his name. Let me tell you the truth. One-on-one -on -one evangelism as we know it will not get the job done. There needs to be an outpouring that will save nations in one day. There needs to be a move of the Spirit that can bring systems and structures under pressure in one day there are about 8 billion people and counting on earth and last I checked there are about 2.8 there about professing Christians both serious and unserious and you match that ratio one on one no the job will not be done the laws of our land today the realities of the time the growing hatred and wickedness for the body of christ may not allow even the luxury of contact in certain nations there has to be another kind of formula that will bring the harvest hmm. are we learning the latter rain the seasons of our pourings are before us I'm still painting the picture of what an awakening, an outpouring, a season of revival, a move of the Spirit. What does it look like? The season of outpouring always comes with greater salvation, massive salvation of souls. Massive salvation of souls beyond the effort of crusades, beyond the effort of tracts. A move of the spirit that you see men being saved sometimes without any physical human being talking to them visions in the similitude of that which happened to Paul and people individuals who in their salvation will be the salvation of a Decapolis one man got saved and ten cities were saved because of him one woman was saved and she ran left her water pot and said come see a man who told me everything I've done? Let me tell you the truth. There are individuals that Satan is fighting their salvation. Some of them are locked up in your family. The reason is because in their salvation will be the salvation of over 10 million other people. 100 million other people. The impact of their conversion testimony can be books that will save others. The impact of their conversion testimony can be messages, volumes of series that will bring many to Jesus and Satan will fight with everything he has when he fights a man from being saved he's not fighting one man he's fighting everybody to be saved through that man hmm. hallelujah so when you see your father refusing to be saved 
your mother refusing to be saved, your siblings refusing to be saved, or people around your family refusing, it's not just the hardness of their heart, it's that there is a weakness locked up in the midst of that rebellion, and Satan is fighting because with the same zeal they served him, that is the same zeal they will serve God, asked Paul. Paul had so much zeal, he went to the high priest to collect letters to persecute the people of God. But when that man encountered God, he flipped over with the same passion. Hmm. The same passion. The same passion. Outpourings culminates to genuine salvation. Can I tell you the truth? Every territory is at the mercy of the number of people saved within that territory. Every territory is at the mercy of the number of people saved within that territory. For as long as there are only few people saved within a territory, it means that there are many bodies Satan can use to fight the purposes of God. He says, a body has thou prepared for me. When we advocate the salvation of men and the salvation of territories, it is because Satan or any spirit for that matter depends on the availability of destinies and bodies for their purposes and their agenda to find expression. When it has to do with the business of salvation, numbers matter. Did you hear what I said? When it has to do with the business of salvation, numbers matter. Having five people saved genuinely and growing and having 1,000 people saved genuinely and growing, the spiritual impact will not be the same. Not be the same. Not be the same. Not be the same. For as long as as our territories are full of godless people, full of people who really do not know God, or full of people who are not even interested. Do you know, Satan will do all within his power to exalt those people to positions where they become a thorn in the flesh to God's program. Satan loves people who are available and are not saved. Do you know why? He places them in positions where he makes it difficult for the witness of the saints to penetrate that environment. Hallelujah. And this is one of the reasons why we must contend we are in the business of the souls of men. We are in the business of the souls of men. Let me repeat it again. We are in the business of the souls of men. Every single soul that Jesus died for matters as far as God's end time program is concerned. The average believer is not conscious of soul winning. We do it sometimes just to ease the guilt of religion and so that it doesn't look like we're not serious with God. But most people have not caught the burden in the heart of God for souls. You don't have to be an evangelist. You just need to understand God's program. Hallelujah. And unfortunately, let me press a bit on this soul winning. Unfortunately, and I think it's something that I pray God will restore to the body. Because... The ratio of the passion that is in the average man of God, and I say this with all due respect, and the average church to see souls saved is below average. We need to trust God for grace. You can do, you can sing, you can dance, you can act drama, you can teach powerfully. If souls are not saved, then the kingdom is not advancing at the pace that should be. Because the journey of every believer first starts with an encounter with the God of the Bible. The journey of the believer does not start with a dexterous teaching ministry. The journey of the believer does not start with receiving miracles. The journey of the believer does not start with welfare. The journey of the believer does not start with good singing and excellence and administration. The journey of the believer does not start with career intelligence. No. In order of spiritual priority, there is only one spiritual process that converts an unbeliever 
to become a believer and that is an encounter not with a man of God not with an angel not with a rhema an encounter with the son of the living God the Bible says he that hath the son hath life and he that does not have the son does not have life and I'm praying that God will grant us as men of God the grace to focus to get back to our assignments and see that there is urgency and work in partnership with the Holy Spirit taking advantage of this outpouring to see to it that the people who sit under our care truly become saved are we together it is easy for Satan to distract us with all kinds of things provided it will not lead to salvation let me tell you this Satan hates salvation Satan hates men being saved. Satan hates men finding the truth. He hates men coming to Jesus in genuine brokenness and repentance to receive his life. Satan will prefer a healing service than a service that leads people to Jesus. Because everybody Jesus healed still died. Everybody Jesus fed still died. Everybody Jesus taught still died. There is only one guarantee for life and meaning beyond this realm, an encounter with the Son of the living God. You believe that? Shout aloud, Amen. Amen. No matter how successful we are, real success in life, in ministry, and in destiny is measured by how many people came to Jesus through your life before other things. Other things are important, but not as important as salvation. I rather someone does not get healed, but get saved. You see that? When I go to pray for people, particularly if they have terminal diseases, my first port of call is not to pray for healing. My first port of call is to guarantee that they are saved. And if they are not, I preach Jesus to them immediately. Because if for any reason I pray for them and they are not healed, and I hear that they've passed on to glory, my greatest joy is that they finally cheated life. But if I pray for someone and they say, oh, the cancer went, this one went, and the person is not saved, I did not do much. Let me educate you believers. In order of spiritual priority, God's ultimate passion is number one, that all men be saved first, then that they come to the knowledge of the truth. You cannot bring people to the knowledge of the truth who are not saved. Beyond a dexterous teaching ministry, beyond an apostolic and a prophetic ministry characterized by great signs and wonders the first objective of the outpouring is to bring a harvest to jesus let me repeat for your learning the first objective of the outpouring the first objective behind the outpouring of the spirit the latter rain is to see to it that many come to the saving knowledge of jesus there is the healing knowledge, there is the prospering knowledge, but in order of priority, the saving knowledge of Jesus. I rather not perform any miracle in my life as a man of God. I rather not have the grace for revelation and illumination to teach. If all I know is the gospel in its simplicity and I'm able to teach as childlike and as simple as possible, it will, it will translate to a harvest of millions of souls within the time God has given me. I would consider myself an extreme success versus performing great signs and wonders, prophesying to people profitably so, ministering the word, dishing out revelation series after series, and then at the end of it, there is a pile of unsaved people who are learned about spiritual things. It is dangerous when someone has not met Christ, but has met church. Because there's almost nothing you would tell them, they will recite your revelation for you, but they have not encountered Jesus. Are we together? Yeah. Church can be a culture that you learn, like English, like Yoruba, like Hausa. You can learn the culture of church, and yet you've not met the King of Kings. You can speak it. How are you welcome to church today? You can speak it. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 2, and yet you have not encountered Christ. You can learn church like a career. The same way you study mathematics, engineering. You can study church.
the greatest and the highest objective of their pouring is to see that people are translated from the kingdom of darkness ladies and gentlemen and those people include our family members our unsaved ones distant or otherwise that they come into a saving functional knowledge of jesus i'm praying that someone seated here who has been crying for power crying for miracles i'm praying for you that in the name of jesus you will reprioritize your passion that the passion to see the lost come to jesus will become the driving force behind your need for power the driving force behind your need for a large congregation the driving force behind your need for more money the driving force behind your need for greater influence whatever it is that you seek if it is not tied to the restoration of men to god then you are asking amiss are we learning Still painting the picture of what an outpouring looks like. Hmm. What comes with an outpouring? Increase and abundance. This is true. Every genuine outpouring of the spirit does not just affect the spiritual lives and the spiritual health in order of priority souls coming to Jesus, lives transformed, territories transformed, but it always culminates to increase and abundance. All through modern history and even from scripture every time there was an outpouring it started by repentance and brokenness and then the Lord heard them and the Lord healed the land if my people the Bible says which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways listen it says then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins but I will not just stop at forgiveness I will heal their land the healing of the land talks of prosperity that God breathes his life again upon the territory Many years ago, I watched a video about the revival and the restoration that happened in Fiji Island. It was so touching. It was such a blessing to me. It inspired me. I watched how that because of the rebellion of the people, I think they murdered some missionaries or something like that. And an indignation rose to heaven. And everything that produced within that territory, based on that documentary, it ceased. The fish stopped multiplying in the river. The earth stopped bringing its increase. And the people got sad. One time, a group of intercessors, prayer warriors, they began to pray for a restoration and revival within the Fiji island. And the Spirit of God ministered to them that there were certain things that needed to be put in place if they wanted to see the power of God come. And they looked for the grandchildren of those missionaries they killed, invited them over in the land, apologized to them nationally. And then they said when they finished by, was it the next day or the next week? I can't remember exactly. The river was flooded with fish. This is a documentary I watched. God heals the land. God can prosper men. Let me tell you the truth. And I'm not a prophet of doom. But in scripture, there are times that famine and economic toil, turmoil comes as a result of the sins of the people. Go and read your Bible. That when people sin against God territorially, corporately, when they become proud and full of themselves, among the many ways God draws them is to touch the economy of that territory. It's true. Because when people, when it affects their eating and their drinking, they can now listen to God. Something happens when people are full. To hell with God, they will say. So, any nation and any territory that begins to find out that economically speaking things are going down among the many policies that must be enacted is genuine repentance to say something is wrong if the earth is reacting the atmosphere is reacting these are forces that are alive they react they react it was on account of the sins of the people that Elijah prayed and there was no rain. You see that until Christ, until God, Jehovah was enthroned again. Look at the land of Samaria. Go and read your Bible. Every time you see 
that it's not every economic problem, but many times when you find out that territories come under economic hardship, among many other reasons, is that an indignation has risen to God and there is a response from heaven. Do you believe that? Joel chapter 2. Give us verse 25. Watch what happens. Joel 2, 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust had eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army. Aha, uh -huh, 26. Now next verse. It says, and ye shall eat in what? And be satisfied. This also follows outpourings. When the latter rain comes, it affects every aspect of your life. Unfortunately for most believers, the moment we find ourselves in extreme levels of lack and plenty, especially when you have done everything to do right. I'm not talking about people who are lazy. I'm not talking about people and, te and territories that are non-productive. When you do everything right and you do not catch fish, maybe you need to step back to a point of brokenness to say, Lord, something is wrong. This business has the best minds there. There is no increase. This shop has the best people. This mall, we have put everything in place. Maybe we need to get back. Could it be that there is a deviation from the ways of God? I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Hallelujah. Salvation of territories. The latter rain brings with it higher dimensions in the spirit. Higher dimension. There is an ascendance. The saints rise to higher levels of the anointing. Greater command of spiritual power. Greater command of spiritual power. Greater command of spiritual power. I'm just painting for you a picture of what a move of God looks like. I'm using all those indices to paint for you a picture. This is, this is how you know that God is moving within a place. If these things are not happening, then the move of God is not happening. It is impossible for the move of God to be happening within a territory and you do not see these things. No. There has never been a genuine move of God that does not capture these indices. Greater command of power. Are we together? A greater manifestation of repentance, brokenness, sinners coming to Jesus, growth, a, a, a flooding of light that the saints command greater spiritual illumination. Signs and wonders influence the influence of the church rising. The word working for people. Manifestations of signs and wonders. And I'm praying in the name of Jesus Christ. That in my lifetime and your lifetime we will see these things return again yeah. that the move of God that is already starting that at its greatest momentum we will not only witness it we will become privileged vessels that will be used to produce that you believe that shout a loud amen yeah. let me tell you this it will be a painful thing in this end time to be a spectator of what God is doing wow Look at what God is doing with people. And God says, what of you? The latter rain. Now, I wrote two things here and I want you to write them down. Then we'll go into the weight of this discussion tonight. Number one, God will never force or impose his program on anyone. Please write that down. God will never force or impose his program. That includes his end time program. God will never force or impose his program upon anyone. It is inconsistent with his character. In as much as God desires an outpouring, in as much as it's part of God's prophetic program in this season, that the nations be saved, that his power be revealed, that the saints be elevated to higher levels of grace. God will never impose his program. God will never impose his program 
on an individual and on a people. The reason is because he created us and gave us the exclusive ability to choose. And isn't it amazing that even at the detriment of your eternal destiny, you can choose that God should live your life alone and he will respect you. There are people today who have had the gospel. It was preached to them and they looked at the person preaching and said, congratulations, shake my hand. I've had everything, but as an act of my will, I reject you and reject Jesus. God will respect them. He will respect their refusal of him. But there are consequences with every decision. Please hear me, ladies and gentlemen. Just because God intends for a mighty move to rest upon Nigeria, upon Africa, upon the nations of the earth, upon your family, upon your business, upon your destiny, it does not mean that prophetic word will come to pass. And the first reason is that God never imposes anything let this give you wisdom already god can prevail upon men and he can be patient until they get to a point of conviction because of the sensitivity of their assignment but god never usurps your will to impose anything the moment you begin any journey that makes it look like it's by force with god discern again that is not the character of god i can choose today as an act of my will that as I drop down from this pulpit, I don't want to be a Christian again. I can choose as an act of my will that I don't want to be a man of God again. God will not just say, okay, go. He will say, no, 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 many destinies are tied to you. So God will prevail upon me. But after a persistent period, if he sees that my decision was an act of my will, not manipulation from demon spirits, I use my will to reject him and reject his program. He will raise another person and allow me to gather with the consequences of my rebellion. That's how God works. Can I tell you, in this end time, there are many people who will carry the bishopric of others because there are people who have been destined. There are families that have been destined. God cannot delay the rising of many because of the carelessness of a few. If you are the one God is raising to be a prophet, and let's say God has apportioned 10 million souls to your prophetic ministry, and you refuse to align, you refuse to love God, you refuse to allow yourself to be malleable, 10 million souls cannot suffer because of your carelessness. God will honor you, but he will bypass you and raise somebody else. I've taught you here, in this end time, you will see people carrying burdens and assignment that was not part of the original script God gave them because they have so aligned they still have the stamina to take more responsibility hallelujah may no one replace you I'm praying for you may God not become tired of waiting for you that you will have to raise a replacement for you. If you are the one ordained to bring your family to the saving knowledge of Jesus, this is a clarion call as you are listening. God is merciful, he's patient, but he's also loving. And his love exceeds all his other attributes. In fact, God is love. God is not mercy. God is not kindness, but he is love. He shows mercy. He shows kindness. But the epitome of who he is in one word is love. And God would rather one person face the consequence of his carelessness and decision than nations come under the judgment of the carelessness of one person. This is how God works. Are you understanding me so far? So for someone you are seated and God is saying, how long? Do you know that by now, if you had stayed with me, there are certain graces you should be walking in now. By now, that apostolic ministry, that prophetic ministry, that evangelistic ministry, that ministry of kingdom financing, maybe based on your prophetic blueprint, if you had worked with God sincerely, by now you would have accessed the measure of wealth to now begin to serve God's program. But you are just beginning. And God is saying, no, it should not be like this. He's calling you 
and he's telling you it's time to stop giving excuses to brace up your spirit for an encounter that translates you to a mighty vessel and I pray for you help them please in the name that is above all names I'm praying for you whatever is causing the spiritual laxity that cancer that is eating up your spirit that will not allow that new wine to emerge let it die this night let it die this night let it die this night in the name of Jesus Christ please be seated please be seated so I told you to write this that God will never force or impose his program on anyone number two the manifestation write this down please the manifestation of God's desire and plan upon the earth depends on the availability the willingness and the yieldedness of the saints let me repeat myself you have to put this down the manifestation of God's desire and God's plan on the earth depends on the availability depends on the willingness and depends on the yieldedness these are three words you should never forget availability willingness and yieldedness of the saints if this that we are saying must happen in our lives in our nation in our churches in our groups in our territories in our businesses in our endeavors it's important for us to know that the manifestation of God's desire and his plan upon the earth depends on the availability depends on the willingness depends on the yieldedness of the saints Isaiah 6 8 the prophet encounters the God of the Bible and among the many things that happen to him when we get to verse 8 he says also I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us whom shall I send and who will go for us and Isaiah replied then said I here am I send me someone shout send me send. say send me Lord send me. shout it say send me Lord send me, say I am, I am available I am willing I am, I am yielded am one more time say I am available I am, I am willing, I am, willing. I, am I am yielded in Luke chapter 1 and verse 38 angel Gabriel comes to Mary revealing to her God's program that Jesus is about to show up in the flesh the word incarnate is about to wear a material body and walk within the frame of this earth and that she had been privileged selected by God now it was up to her to partner with God she asked a few questions like every human should how shall these things be seeing that I know not a man and the angel explained to her by the time we get to verse 38 Mary said behold the handmaid of the Lord I like this he never said behold the woman behold I, I donate myself if this is what God wants to do behold the handmaid of the Lord he says be it unto me not just according to my desire be it unto me according to your word do you know the angel never left till he got this answer the angel brought a message. You would think when he was done, he would have said, Mary, whether you like it or not, you must be pregnant. I'm just telling you, be ready. No. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word. And Gabriel said, thank you very much. Heaven has gotten the reply and he left. Hmm. I learned this early in life that God is mighty. He can do without me but he has chosen to depend on me. God can do without me, oh. God can do without you. God can do without Koinonia. God can do without Nigeria. He is God by himself. Before Nigeria, before Africa was, before Joshua Selman was, before Koinonia was, God is and he remains God. But when God chooses to incorporate us in his program, we must see that as an eternal privilege. Are we together? 
you must see that as an eternal privilege and then open up your spirit to plunge into what he's doing knowing that God can do without me but my God he has chosen to bring me as part of his end time army God can do without your family but he has chosen to incorporate your family I have always been flattered till I became concerned about why God becomes vulnerable over men. When God begins to pursue a man, sometimes it looks as if he's not God. God will prevail on you. He will send people to beg you. He, God, when you see God looking for a man, sometimes it's embarrassing for God to be doing that kind of thing. And yet he does it without shame. He will run after you. He will send helpers. He will bring you dreams. You will shout at him and say, God, I'm not interested. Then he will wait three more years until your ways bring you to your knees. Then he will come again and say, I'm still there. Hmm. This is God for you. I wondered for a long time, God, is it that you cannot do without men? You act as if you lost your creativity. This is God for you. Don't let the devil lie to you and say God cannot use you. He can do without you. Settle that for a fact. But find consolation that he has created a space for you in his program. And it doesn't matter who believes in you or who does not believe in you. They may look at you and say you of your family. You think God is stupid. He doesn't have men that he wants to come to this family. This is what changed my life. When I found out that God could do without me but he has chosen to depend on me. It made me feel special. It made me feel unique. And I said, for this, I will run and spend my days honoring that trust. No shadow you will light up, mountain you will climb up, coming after me. No wall you will kick down, lie you will tear down, coming after me. No shadow you will light up. No wall you won't kick down. No wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming out to me. Listen, before we continue, I sense in my heart to speak to someone. God is saying, I'm still waiting for you. I'm still waiting. I started with you on campus, but you left me on the way. I'm still waiting. Even though it is 10 years now, I'm still waiting. You started after a revival meeting, but something distracted you away from me. And the maker is saying, I'm still waiting. Still waiting. I've not changed my plan concerning you. What I told you 20 years ago is still what I'm saying. I would have replaced you but I see the sincerity of your heart and God is coming to you again. He's giving you a chance again. Someone shout again, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Send me to my family. Send me to that business. Send me to the crusade ground. Send me to that prophetic outpost. Send me. I am ready and I'm available. No shadow you will light up. Mountain you will climb up. Coming after me, no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. When God insists on finding a man, he becomes vulnerable almost to a point of shame, and he does not mind. He won't force you, but he will pursue you almost with the vulnerability of a fool he will wait for you he will look for you oh god i'm giving birth to children now i don't have time for you i tell you sometimes he can be patient till you give birth to your last child then he comes again he says i met you 12 years ago are you now ready for me i can still use you even though time is gone you can still make the most of the 10 years left This is God for you. Koinonia, this is God for you. 
Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, He chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night tonight. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. That song was for you. God is still looking for you. God is still looking for you. God is not like a man who abandons people. He can be patient. You roam around your life running away from God, but you are still a prophet. That mantle is still hovering around you. You roam around running away from God, but you are still an evangelist. Those souls are still come. You've not opened your mouth and told God no. And because you've not told him no, he's still patient. He's still patient. He's saying you are still Esther. He's saying you are still Deborah. He's saying you are still Abraham. You are still Gideon. Provided you've not opened your mouth to reject the call, he will still chase after you. shadow you will light up mountain you will climb up coming after me no wall you will kick down lie you will hallelujah please hear me I'm prophesying to someone God is saying I should tell you when you were between the age of 13 and 18 you, you had dreams. You had a notebook where you wrote those dreams. And God is saying that you have rejected the call, but that he's calling you now. I'm not saying this to everybody. Between the age of 13 and 18, you were having visionary encounters. God will come to you. He showed you things. You asked pastors questions they could not answer. That thing was a call. It was a mantle upon your life. And now, after many years, you try to run away from church, but God has brought you back. You try to do your own thing to live your life. God is saying, I'm still calling you. I'm still calling you to return unto me. And I'm telling you prophetically, you can choose to reject the call, but he's stretching his hands tonight. Return back to that call. 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 You can reject him, but he's stretching his hands. Return back to that call. Those visions were not a waste. The dreams you saw were not a waste. The programs you went to were not a waste. The videos you watched were not a waste. Ale shabaranda skavadiata. Someone shout again, say, Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. I am available. I am willing. I am yielded. I am available. I am willing. I am yielded. Listen. 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 Please, I want you to listen to me. I will return back preaching, but I'm prophesying now. I want you to listen to me. I'm hearing in my spirit again. This is particularly to a lady. This is particularly to a lady. The Lord is telling me that I should tell you that there is a healing ministry God promised you. A healing ministry He gave you. But until now, you have not opened up your spirit to receive that anointing it's a healing ministry not just a teaching ministry not just a prophetic ministry is a mighty healing ministry you have seen this many times prophetic words have come concerning it but you see let me tell you for every call there is a consecration that follows calls just because God called you does not mean you will become 
Don't let people die because of rebellion. No. There are people here who have been called by now. You should have been commanding wealth of nations for the sake of the kingdom. But because you have chosen to do it your way, the foolishness of God's way, you see, God's way does not make sense. You can push him and say, I know how to make money by myself. And you keep struggling and going around in circles. If you patiently followed his way, you would have stepped into your Rehoboth. In one minute, can someone cry and say, Lord, I repent, I return, I return, I repent, I repent. I'm tired of going my own way, tired of creating my own programs for my life. Come on, someone is praying. You're following online, pray. I'm tired of inventing my own way to live in my life and my destiny. I'm ready to return to the blueprint. I'm ready to return to the manuscript. No matter how you've deviated, his mercy can bring you back. Lord, you called me a worshiper. I'm ready to return to my office. You called me a worshiper. You called me a businessman. You called me an entrepreneur for the kingdom. Take a minute to pray. That genuine prayer of repentance. To repent means to realign. To repent means to realign. To repent means to realign. Take a minute. Let it be genuine repentance from your spirit. I cannot lose this call. There is so much that is vested upon my life. Someone is praying. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Please sit down. So the manifestation of God's desire and plan on the earth depends on the availability, the willingness, and the yieldedness of the saints.